Welcome to The Wise Podcast, hosted by me, Kate Conway, and kindly sponsored by ID Verde. They are the UK and Europe's leading provider of grounds, maintenance services and landscape creation projects. They actively engage with social enterprises to build them into their supply chain. Today, I'm delighted to say I'll be chatting to Dr. Claire Cahy from Sensations. It's, it's such a pre- pleasure to have you here today. Um, you're from Sensations. Um, and the saying of Sensations is special educational needs. That's right, yeah. Tell us in a nutshell what Sensations is. Okay, so we are a not-for-profit company who work with children with special educational needs in lots of different areas. Um, we work directly with children, um, both for assessment um, and also for intervention support. So um, once a child has been diagnosed with a condition, um, we might be able to help with behaviour or um, anxiety or lots of different things. Um, we also provide sort of recreational activities, so things like summer schemes, um, for specifically for children with special needs because sometimes those kids find it hard to um, fit in with the normal kind of leisure centre type um, summer scheme. There may be, um, you know, maybe there's too many people or the environment's just not quite right. Um, we work, I suppose, with, with schools as well. We go out to schools and provide staff training. Um, and oh my goodness a, a, a lot of different things i suppose and um, we also have our own independent special school which is called sensations nest um, and that's just three years old now so you, you've given us a very nutshell mm-hmm. uh, approach there so it's kind of all folded up like a little origami bird so let's open mm-hmm. it up because there's a lot of different layers to what you do but we'll start with the with the assessments um now i have to admit uh, this is not an area that i um I'm familiar with and that's probably a good thing it means that we can just kind of go from mm-hmm. first principles mm-hmm. here so explain then um what the what the, what the assessments are and, and why you guys need to be doing them okay so um by trade i am an educational psychologist so um my role involves diagnosis of certain learning conditions so that can be um purely cognitive conditions like maybe dyslexia or dyscalculia which would be the maths version um of that um I work then as part of a multidisciplinary team with our speech therapists, occupational therapy, um, paediatricians and behaviour therapists um, to look at diagnosis of things like autism and ADHD. So those more complex neurodevelopmental conditions, um, no one single clinician can make that decision on their own. So we have to have um, you know, a, a number of people looking at the child from, I suppose, different perspectives in order to make sure that we're definitely making the right call uh, because it's such a life-changing thing for people. And I suppose increasingly, actually, we're getting adults coming through looking for assessment of that too. They're maybe feeling like things hadn't been picked up in their childhood. Um, and quite often, actually, if a, a, a parent has come to us for their child to be assessed for autism, they might realise as we're talking to them about the various difficulties that are associated with that, that they, they start to think, oh, I did that, or, I, you know, and, and they recognise those symptoms within themselves. Um, so people tend to come to us for those assessments because the NHS um, waiting lists are unfortunately very long. Um, so okay, so when you say very long, mm-hmm. what do you mean? Depending on, you know, geographically where you live and what health trust um, I suppose the one that I'm most familiar with would be Belfast and at, at the moment um, an autism assessment wait list is about three years um, and ADHD about four years. Years? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you're if you, if you have a child who's maybe sort of five or six and you're just starting to display mm-hmm. behaviour or whatever mm-hmm. then it might have that's a long time in a child's yeah. life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So oh. and what maybe started out quite a small difficulty that would have been relatively easily rectified with good early intervention. By the time it's actually picked up and and diagnosed, then it's often become a much bigger, more entrenched problem that's harder to harder to intervene with. Okay. Okay. So wh- why are the weightless? Why is it so long? Oh my goodness. Well, I suppose there's probably lots of different reasons for that. Um, the, the level of need in Northern Ireland has increased over over the years. Um, there's lots of different theories a, about that. I suppose there's certain genetic conditions would be more common um, within Northern Ireland. Um, and there is a, a theory that autism has a, a genetic component and a lot of the research would be looking at that side of things at the moment. Um, so that could be one reason. Unfortunately, COVID has also had a knock-on impact on waitlist times because the assessment process for autism in particular is quite hands-on and you do end up within close contact so those all had to be paused um, during the pandemic so we're only just now getting back into 
um, and being able to do direct assessment. So, you know, while wait lists were lengthy already, there's probably now an extra year essentially has been added on because of, of the pandemic. Okay, it's very, very frustrating. So, mm -hmm. um, so essentially they can come to you, you will do the assessment and then the results of that can be taken directly to the school, to, the, to their GP, yeah. to yeah. whatever, mm -hmm. and then um, the, the sort of assistance or whatever they need can be put in place. Yeah, so I suppose the, the process of getting assistance within um, within schools is a, a bit of a, a minefield, to be quite honest. Um, but certainly the the diagnosis and identification of needs can can certainly help um, with access to to that, um, because assessment within school um, is another lengthy wait. So even if you have a diagnosis, that doesn't automatically entitle you to support within the school system, because um, the healthcare system and education tend to be quite separate entities in Northern Ireland rather than, um, I suppose, working together. Mm -hmm. So even once a diagnosis happens, then there's still a whole process that has to go on through the Education Authority in order to access support within the classroom. Okay, but at least you're kind of cutting out that yeah, initial... Yeah, exactly. So it's just moving things along that little bit. And aside from anything else, you know, we do get some children who really don't need a great deal of support in, in school but maybe at home they're really suffering in terms of their mental health and it's costing them a lot um, emotionally to hold everything together during the school day and then they come home and it all comes out at home and so maybe a lot more of the difficulties might be present in the family home and that puts pressure on everybody. So sometimes even just having um, the need identified and giving parents some strategies to use at home to try and relieve those difficulties. Sometimes that's all people want. They don't necessarily want the diagnosis to get access to something. It's more about your own understanding and particularly for young people in the teenage years, it's important for them to understand themselves and to maybe you know, I suppose have that as part of their identity and um, to understand that this is why my friends don't find this hard, um, you know, that I, I'm that little bit different. Um, and sometimes that comes as a real relief to teenagers because they've maybe been beating themselves up that, um, you know, that they're just odd or um, that they're somehow doing something that's their fault and that's why um, they're struggling, whereas it can be a big relief to, to actually be able to say to them, you know what, this is why. Um, so that's that's an important factor in itself. Yes, yeah, suppose if they can identify, mm -hmm. look, you know, this is how I feel about this. So when this happens, can you do this yeah. or whatever? Yeah. But mm -hmm. and that's something else that you do then that, that I wanted to move on to. You you work a lot with parents then to, to say, well, well, this is why this is happening. Yep, absolutely. So we provide parent training sessions um, once once a month, usually. Now, again, COVID, you know, knocked everything for six. Um, but we're in the process of moving all of those trainings into webinar format so that then um, parents can access those really at any time then to watch in, in their own time. Um, and you know, when you're a parent of a child who has additional needs, it's hard to get time to yourself. So um, it's not always easy for parents to be able to drop everything and go to a different, you know, to a venue in order to to um, attend training. So in, in ways, I suppose COVID has maybe spurred people on to think about how to adapt things around um, around people's circumstances. So we we run training sessions that parents can just book themselves on to via um, you know, Eventbrite or whatever. And we do lots of different topics. So mental health, anxiety, um, we do um, autism, ADHD, we do trainings on like puberty and adolescence. Um, you know, kids don't come with a handbook and it would be so much easier if they did. Um, but it's nice to be able to, to say to parents, I know you've never come across this before, but I have, and this is what works. Okay, that must mm -hmm. be very reassuring for them then. And then you work with um, you work with teachers as well, so the training isn't just for for parents. No, um, we quite often would do it during the um, the August staff training days that um, that schools tend to get just before school begins again, and um, so. Um, principals and senkos and whatever would often come to us and say we've identified. X, Y, or Z as a need for our staff development. Could you come in and carry out some training? So it could be speech and language skills or um, attachment and trauma would be a, a topic that quite often comes up in Northern Ireland. You know, I think increasingly there's a recognition that um, there's a, a sort of transgenerational trauma that goes on that um, parents who have maybe um, unmet needs themselves from having difficult childhoods are then parenting 
children um, who then continue that cycle of having maybe um, maladaptive ways of coping with stress. Um, so I think schools are becoming really good at picking that up and realising that they need to make changes to adapt around the family's needs of their community. Okay. And so you'll do that with schools, but then also mm -hmm. if, if someone's a teacher that the school hasn't offered that, they could come to you? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Again, they can just book themselves on to some of our, our trainings um, themselves um, and come and attend. And that that's, I suppose, happening more and more um, that the teachers are trying to just, I suppose, if funds are tight with schools and, you know, if they're able to access something themselves, then they'll, they'll, they'll do that. Okay. Well, that's, that's good mm -hmm. to know they, they can do that. So, um, and you... you I mentioned when we spoke before that um, you're also helping a lot of sort of teachers and schools to, to work with preparing to return after lockdown, sort of the impact of... Yes, so we developed a, a project called Project Cocoon um, with the idea really being of how do we try and surround children and protect them during this time that's so unprecedented and so difficult. So we approached um, the National Lottery um, Community Fund and put in an application to fund that um, and thankfully we were successful. So there were lots of different, I suppose, strands to that project, but one of them was going into schools and providing free training on um, what we call the recovery curriculum. So trying to take the focus off the academic because I know everybody, um, you know, parents, I, I'm worried about how much my children have missed academically. But at the moment, um, you know, we really need to focus on their, their well-being. It, learning is very much like a pyramid and that bottom um, part of it is your happiness and well-being and you cannot learn and develop skills in reading and writing and maths unless you feel safe and secure um, in your learning environment and really COVID, um, COVID took that away from kids you know um, I suppose none of us ever had to, to go through periods where you couldn't sit next to your friend, that you had to stay at a distance, that you couldn't give um, granny a hug or that you're out um, in the community and people have masks over their faces. You know, that this is a really weird thing that our kids have had to, to go through. And I think even the number of very small children who have words like virus and vaccine and coronavirus in their vocabulary, that in itself is not normal. Mm. You know? No, no. Mm -hmm. And the fact that there was no real, uh, which affected everybody, that there were no goalposts wasn't even that they were moving them, but just nobody knew. And yeah. that must have yeah. been because obviously they, they picked up on the insecurity at home in terms of... Absolutely. If people yeah. are, aren't aren't sure what's that, you know, and parents couldn't even really reassure their children because this is a really big problem. And, um, you know, you don't want to lie, but then at the same time, uh, you know, you're trying not to frighten children. So I think... Parents were in a tough spot too in terms of what, how much do you tell them, but then children pick up things off the news or they hear people talking. Um, and particularly for children, you know, maybe with a learning difficulty or on the autism spectrum, um, where routine is really important to them. And um, it can take a long time for school staff to build up trust and rapport with a child like that. And then effectively they had that rapport one day and then the next day it was gone and gone for nearly a year. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really hard and that's gonna take a long time to build up again um, with, with the children. So helping teachers to know what are the activities that I can do, what, what can I do in advance um, before they come back, um, how, how do we kind of try to keep that connection, because obviously we're only getting kids back into school now and now the summer holidays are going to come up, so that's another disconnect that's, that's coming again, um, and while we can predict that as adults, can a child with a learning difficulty, you know, we, there's things that we need to be doing in advance really to prepare that child. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's, that's good, that's available. And then um, another sort of strand of what you do then is the is the recreational opportunities and leisure. Tell us about some of those, you know, summer schemes and holiday clubs. Yeah, no, uh, I suppose again, um, COVID is a, a theme that comes up again and again. We weren't able to do that last year um, because of, you know, sort of um, social restrictions. But we, generally speaking, offer summer schemes on, you know, for lots of different um, needs. I suppose one of our most popular ones would be for children who are transitioning to post-primary school. So we try to work to prepare um, children and young people, both with and without additional needs, in uh, the life skills that they might need. You know, that I suppose 
primary school um, is a very secure environment, generally speaking, and usually much smaller. The transition into physically much bigger environments and um, with much older, more streetwise children around you and having to navigate um, all of those things that come with post-primary school. Um, so we, we carry out usually a week-long summer scheme for those, um, those children who are about to transition and we work on really basic skills like um, can you read a class timetable, can you pack a school bag, do you know how to do a tie? You know a lot of primary schools don't, don't have ties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so do you know how to um, put your uniform on? Um, can you read a bus timetable? Do you know how to get a bus? Um, you know, we, we can literally, we go out and practice paying your own bus fare and getting onto the bus and going and, uh, you know, maybe paying for an ice cream somewhere and then coming back. Um, because all of those things like using the canteen and so on and uh, you know that those are things that some children have just never been exposed to um, and that they I suppose it can really reduce the anxiety if they've had that little bit of experience of doing things beforehand. Mm -hmm. It's a lot all at once now that we've yeah, really it like that. Yeah it really like, really is. Oh gosh yeah all of those things Absolutely. yeah we're throwing at you at once. Um, and then the, there's a youth club and a friendship club as well, is that right? Yeah, um, again, again, everything's yeah. paused. But yes, we did. And my two behaviour therapists, who are fabulous girls called Jodie and Sharon, um, they um, would have run... Um, a, a weekly youth club for sort of young people who are on the autism spectrum um, and I suppose that very much is about trying to um, get young people into an environment where everyone's on the same footing um, you know it's it's hard for kids with additional needs to go into the, the youth club down the street because they don't always feel like they fit in um, whereas you know um, I suppose within our context um, Autism becomes very much part of an identity that our kids are proud of in, in that sense. You know, we, we call it Team Quirky <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. and they're quite proud to be part of Team Quirky and they're, they're quite aware that their brain works differently to everybody else and that makes them a bit special. Um, and so nobody, I suppose, feels left out in that type of environment. Um, and yes, um, the girls also ran a, a Saturday club, which is more for children um, who are little tinies and um, who are, are maybe um, just starting to show some difficulties and their parents want them to get that little bit of practice in quite a secure environment where the staff are expert so um, you know if their child has a meltdown or whatever that's nothing to us we see it every day and we know how to cope with it um, and we can model how to cope with it um, for the, the child and teach them those regulation skills while they're really tiny so that hopefully those issues don't carry up with them as they get older. Mm -hmm. So all of those things then feed into the nest Mm. I love all the names like the cocoon, the <laughs> nest, and Team Quirky. It's all very, it's all just very warm. So t tell us about uh, about the nest then. So the nest is our independent special school. Um, we are just coming to the end of our third year. Um, it is the the only school of its kind. So um, in Northern Ireland, there are actually only a handful of independent schools in general, um, but there are, are no other special schools. So we take children who either have been having difficulty in their school placement or that they were in a situation where they didn't actually get offered uh, a place in a special school, even though parents felt that they needed it. Um, so at the moment we have 10 pupils, um, it's a really high pupil to staff ratio and we have weekly speech therapy, occupational therapy and psychology and so I'll go up and um, work with children therapeutically and so do my behaviour therapists um, and the staff are well trained in things like Makaton, so signing for, for children with special needs and all of the various behavioural approaches that are um, our best practice for working with children. Um, at the moment, I suppose our cohort is um, mainly children with Down syndrome and autism. And they come from all over Northern Ireland. We have one wee guy who's been with us since day one and he travels to us from Newry every day. Um, from Newry? <laughs> so, so let me bring you back to a couple of points you made there. You're the only school like this in Northern Ireland, only independent special school in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. But then after that you said, for some, for some children who weren't given a place in school, what, yeah. what happens if you don't <laughs> get given a place in school? Well, it's not that they wouldn't be given any place, um, but there are children out there who um, have certainly a, a degree of learning difficulty or even you know, quite a severe learning difficulty, but there aren't enough special school placements in Northern Ireland to meet the demand that we're seeing. And so there are some children ultimately who won't be given a, a place. 
um, and therefore their parents, I suppose, have the choice of going down the mainstream route. Um, or maybe some might choose to homeschool. Um, we, you know, uh, but this is the, this has been the position for several of our pupils this year, particularly in the preschool year. So because the nursery year is not statutory, so you don't have to send your child to, to mm -hmm. nursery school, you can keep them home until P1. Um, and so if there aren't enough nursery places, the education authority aren't actually bound to find one um, because nur nursery is not statutory. So we've had um, several of our pupils this year in particular were little ones who had Downs or maybe genetic conditions or medical needs who unfortunately just weren't able to get a place in special. So um, in order to give them that early intervention, um, parents have opted to to come to us and that does involve a fee. Um, but I suppose it's um, parents are weighing up um, you know, what their, their options are. And I suppose it's probably a similar fee to what you would pay for childcare. So um, you know, maybe that's how they're kind of balancing things up for them. We are hoping that eventually we might get some funding from the Education Authority in order to place children with us. Um, we just recently, um, gosh, that actually feels like a lifetime ago, but it was in uh, November, we had um, our first inspection by the Department of Education and that went really, really well. And um, they were delighted with the progress that children were making. So we're hoping that now that that's been kind of officially passed, that maybe the Education Authority might consider starting to, to fund some spots for children who they haven't been able to, to give a place to elsewhere. You're just so, um, you've explained it so calmly and so like, yes, well, this happens, it happens. I just feel horrified. <laughs> by what you're telling me and yeah. uh, so, so what, essentially what ha what will happen is a parent will, will get a letter or a phone call or something from the from the education board to say sorry we've no place full stop yeah and then they're like well what do i do where's yeah. the where's the next page of this letter what where, where are my, where's my list of options that's it so it's just right okay dead end close the door in your face is that basically unfortunately it? i mean i think the thing is that um you know, we're all working within a very imperfect system, you know, um, and the people who went into special education, you know, either in an environment like my own or within statutory kind of um, bodies, they all did it because they want to help kids. Um, but there's just not enough funding and there's just not enough um, investment in that. So, you know, I suppose there's this um, notion that inclusion is the thing um, that you know any child should theoretically be able to go to their local mainstream school and that they'll be included in that class but unfortunately the the issue is that sometimes rather than being really included they're actually just integrated rather than you know so um they still would be viewed maybe as the different child or maybe the staff don't have the relevant training in order to, to really properly meet their needs and that's when it then becomes that it's actually not fair on that child to um, to be in in mainstream that they would actually be really flourishing much more if they were in a more specialist environment so it's a really difficult um position for for everybody in education you know it's not i don't think that there's anyone who would say they love the, <laughs> that this is the position we're in. Um, and for me, it's a case of, you know, I would love that parents weren't having to pay us for our services, but I'm in a position where it's either I can help some or I can help none. And, and that's where we are. So this is why I love social enterprise, mm -hmm. because it generally, through the course of the podcast, I've got to speak to people who were, um, you know, obviously, you're incredibly, you know, intelligent, talented, motivated person. You could work anywhere. You could be, do you know what I mean? You could do any number of things, but you saw a need and you had to address it. And you, you, yeah. weren't, you just weren't able to not do it. Yeah. And I think that's where I've been really lucky with my team members as well, because um, I've really been able to rely on um, the, the individuals who have ended up coming my way you know you're just either sensations or you're not <laughs> there there are some people that just the way that we work um wouldn't suit them and uh, and that's absolutely fine um, but i suppose I'm, I'm really really lucky that the folks in my team are of a similar mindset to me where we want to be able to change it and um and that just no isn't good enough for our mm -hmm, kids mm -hmm. um and i suppose lots of us have personal experience you know um, i have a brother with autism um 
and lots of our staff, my um, administrative staff, I have three girls um, working in the office and all of them have children who have special needs and have been through the special school system and, and so on. And that I think makes a big difference because if you are a mummy or a daddy or a granny or whoever who is ringing, picking up the phone to say to some stranger, I'm really worried about my child, you really want to be able to rely on them having empathy for you and being able to give you accurate guidance. And so I think what's really wonderful about our team is that they are so grounded in experience and per personal experience. So, you know, my, my girls in the office are able to, to sit and just have a chat. And, you know, our um, our centre coordinator, Sue, is fabulous and she is has been known to spend hours on the phone to, to parents who are upset and trying to calm them. And, you know, even if, the, even if they don't end up coming to us for any sort of paid service, that in itself is worth a fortune for people to be able to be heard. It must be such a relief to just for somebody to, to for them to get someone on the end of the phone or whatever who just goes, yeah, come here. Mm -hmm. I've got you. I know. Yeah. What you, I know what they say. Come here. I've been there and yep. look after them. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and th that the impact of that is just is phenomenal. As you say, even if it's even if they don't then use your services, that they've as you say yeah. they've been heard. Yep. And they've been heard mm -hmm. and they've been seen. So in terms of. Um, the future and the kind of people that you'd like to connect with as a result of our conversation today. Um, parents, businesses, what, what kind of people are you keen to hear from? Oh, okay. So, I mean, we, we always love to hear from parents and, and schools. And, you know, if, if you are a, a parent or a school out there who are thinking, I wonder if Sensation could, could help me with this, you know, just the services that we've talked about or that are on our website, you know, nothing is absolute for us. So if, if you're thinking, do you know what would be great would be this, you know, we're always very open to suggestion um, from people. Um, it, it's important that the, the actual communities who we're trying to support are telling us what they need um, rather than us making an assumption. Um, funding is always an issue, I suppose, for, um, for social enterprises and charities. And so I suppose people who could be involved in fundraising um, would be amazing um, so to corporate help. sponsorship or yeah, yeah absolutely that would be brilliant so the nest has just been given charitable status um, and so we would love to hear from any companies who would like to have us as their charity of the year or if they have um, you know sort of co corporate social responsibility type policies that they would like to become involved um, you know we we always have um, have work in and around the nest that people can come and volunteer to do we have lots of lovely grounds and um, that we're hoping to eventually be able to develop in to um, you know, sort of uh, allotment type spaces where our families can come up and work together. Um, we also have a, a therapy pony who um, loves company and <laughs> loves the cuddles. Um, so there's there's lots and lots that we we would be um, very willing to have volunteers come and um, be part of, um, particularly during things like the summer schemes where we definitely need an extra pair of hands. Um, but funding, I suppose, is the bottom line in terms of survival for social enterprises. And it's it's horrible that it does come down to that. But ultimately, if I can't pay the wages, then we can't, you know, do, we can't do anything. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So where can people get in touch with you then if they wanted to, to just kind of see what you do or get sure. involved? Yeah. Um, so um, we work a lot through Facebook, actually. I suppose that's where probably most of our parents get, you know, get in touch with us. Um, and so it is Facebook uh, forward slash sensations NI and so we tend to keep that really well updated um, in terms of what's going on and um, you know we'll advertise any of our training sessions and um, summer schemes and things always go on there first and um, they can always lift the phone and just have a chat with Sue or one of the other girls um, and you know what I would say I suppose is don't be alone in your worry about kids um, you know, there's nothing worse as a parent than having something that you're really concerned about, um, particularly in the, the realm of mental health. You know, uh, we're in a society where that is such a big deal and um, don't sit on it. If, if you're a parent or a grandparent or carer who's worried about a child, lift the phone. And even if we can give you one or two ideas um, just to, to try, then, you know, you've won. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you. No, not at all. Thank you very much. Tune in next week when I'll be chatting to Jenny Irvine from ARC Healthy Living Centre. Thanks again to Dr. Claire Cahey from Sensations and also to ID Verde, our sponsor. If you're a social enterprise and you'd like to find out more about opportunities to work with ID Verde, please contact Amanda at Social Enterprise NI.